saying signal processing a lot, but I haven't really explained exactly what a signal is. Um, as far as a computer is concerned, a signal is usually just a stream of numbers. So you have two dimensional signals and their images, and you have one dimensional signals and that's audio. Um, and as far as the computer is concerned, they're kind of almost the same thing, just in different dimensions. Like it doesn't really care that uh, pixels are <coughs> images for your eyes and uh, one dimensional signal is audio for your ears. It's just numbers that you can do stuff with. Um, so keeping that in mind, this is an experiment I did um, a few months ago. Uh, trying to mix the boundary between uh, audio and visuals, sort of just taking audio, like raw audio coming off of uh, a microphone, or in this case, it's gonna be live off of sound, and then just sort of blasting that into an open GL texture, like just as is, and then um, doing sort of the minimum amount of signal processing, massaging to get it to do something cool. In this case, just taking the difference between the two channels and making that color. <laughs> two functions or two signals and you sort of 
rub them on each other, and it calculates the area underneath the signal. So in this case, you have two inputs, the red uh, signal and the blue signal, and you move the red signal over the blue one, and then the output is this black line. Um, but you don't have to actually know all that stuff when you're using it. It's like one line of code. In OpenCV, it's this filter 2D because you usually use it to filter images. Um, BDSP is this thing that comes with uh, OS X and iOS. It's like already there. Um, and it's also just one line of code. So you can start experimenting with it, putting images in, and seeing what comes out. <coughs> so let's do that. <laughs> I didn't know that this podium would be all handily actually. <laughs> Um, so this is a uh, convolution being applied live to my uh, webcam. The uh, three by three image in the bottom right is the kernel. So it's the small signal that's being rubbed over the bigger signal, which is the uh, image that you're seeing. And this is sort of like a no operation kernel. All it does is it takes 100% of the pixel that it's on and 0% of the pixels around it. Um, so the visualization I'm using here, the white is like 100% and black is negative 100%, which is kind of hard to intuit visually just because a negative pixel doesn't really make much sense, right? Um, but I'm going to run through a couple of kernels, and then if you see black, that's a subtraction, and white is an addition, and gray is sort of nothing. Um, so you can do motion blur by sort of just drawing a line, and like the size of the kernel is going to have the blur. Um, you can do like Gaussian blur by just sort of doing this sort of fading off cone thing. Um, box blur by just doing a box and averaging everything in it. Uh, we can do sharpen by sort of uh, taking the difference of a pixel and then the pixels around it. So the difference as the next attraction tip. Um, we can do a boss, which looks super awesome, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, which is like add the pixel uh, to the top left, subtract the one on the bottom right. Uh, and so once you kind of get this workflow going, you can just sort of start stuffing kernels in and seeing what comes out and sort of start developing that intuition. Um, so this is just like random Perlin noise and you can see like when the Perlin noise kind of uh, is, uh, has way more white pixels than black pixels, but the image gets kind of blown out. When it gets dark, you get these sort of dark uh, images. Um, and so those are all the things you kind of find if you Google like convolution, like uh, two-dimensional image process, uh, single processing. Um, and you don't usually end up using them in practice because, I mean, whatever, they, you, don't, you, you don't, wouldn't usually look, use convolution to make an image look nice. You've got to use it to derive data from an image. So this is a filter. This is one of the assembly filters that you can use to start deriving cool data from an image. This is a Gabor filter, or Gabor, Gabor kernel. Um, and you can use it uh, to, it's, <laughs> so you remember what I was saying before, like uh, sine waves are kind of good at encoding sort of natural logic. Uh, this is a visual sine wave, um, and I'm just sort of spinning it over time to show you how uh, it changes things as uh, the angle changes. You can see, like on my shirt, you kind of see it when it's horizontal. Um, and like, if you head in the valley, you get like your DJ stuff. <laughs> um, but yeah, our, our usual settings for this are like somewhere over here. And uh, usually with a Gabber kernel, you would like kind of put a few of them, you would, you would put a few of them into the same kernel to sort of trace out things like a character to recognize like A, B, C, D, you just sort of trace the important parts of it to sort of uh, highlight those images and say like if it ends up being pretty bright, <coughs> to C, and so on. Um, so convolution is usually used for edge detection, which is sort of like pre-processing before then getting the computer to understand an image, because this makes it like, you can tell already like, there's some edges. Um, and it's really easy for the computer to look at an image like this and just trace the lines. And then you have an object with uh, like width and height and a center of mass and that sort of thing that you can start using to uh, drive whatever interactive experience you're designing. Um, so you can like all make horizontal lines and sort of drawing a horizontal line that's subtracting the horizontal lines around it. Vertical lines like my shirt disappears and it just have like many vertical lines. Uh, this is like Bullshit edge detection. <laughs> this is the Mexican hat filter. <laughs> That's actually what it's called for real. Um, so it, this actually is happening to work really well, and I'm actually fit really well. Um, it, this tends to be almost too noisy to use in practice, but sometimes you can get away with it in like a nice light, lighting situation because this is like a really vast way of getting edges highlighted because um, it's only one step. You just kind of do the one filter and then you get edges. Um, usually you do something more complex. So this is like half of the Sobel operator. The 
this field I have. So by combining these two images, you can start to um, you can calculate angles of edges. So you can be this more smart about it. So like if something's got some totally ridiculous angle, then you're like, that can't be an edge, uh, and so on. Uh, so this is one you might actually use in practice, the Sobel edge detector. Um, this is a, a much better one, but a bit slower, that uh, starts off with a convolution step and then does a couple uh, more tricks to uh, give you proper edges. This is the candy edge detector. <coughs> Uh, it's got like thresholds, so if I like put it all over the side, it's getting all this random noise from behind and saying like those are all edges. Yeah. Am I boring you all yet? No. Nope. Uh, nope. Man. <laughs> uh, okay, so I'm going to get to some actual uses for this, uh, or actual ways that I've used this uh, in practice. So um, if you have a connect and you're pointing it at a flat, or a holder connect and you're pointing it at a flat surface, and especially if it's a little bit far away and you're trying to like really push the connect to the limit of like, what sort of things it can detect, you start getting these vertical bands. And they're really unpredictable. Sometimes there's like 16 of them. Uh, they move, they do all kinds of stuff that fucks up your edge detection. So when you try and sell like that's an iPhone on a table from six feet away, these lines totally override it. Uh, and if you Google this, I mean, like, they're aware, they say, like, this is somebody from Microsoft, presumably, that says, like, you could try applying some filter. That would be exciting. Um, so in Photoshop, you can kind of play around with this live, like, you just go uh, filter other custom, and then uh, you can start typing in numbers, like, just how I was showing you uh, kernels before, and you get live updates. So you can just take a screenshot of something that you want to filter out, play around with it for a while. In this case, this happened to work pretty well. This is another sort of like bullshit duct tape solution, but it totally worked. <laughs> uh, which is sort of like a, a horizontal motion blur kind of with an inverted edge detector, which is sort of what I ended up with there. Um, yeah. OK, so signals. Two-dimensional images, one-dimensional sound. Um, or other things, but one-dimensional, or sound is a one-dimensional signal. Um, how, does anybody, how many people here do like audio engineering, like recording guitars and doing that sort of thing? Um, so you probably heard of convolution in that context because it's uh, really applicable to reverb. Uh, reverb being sort of like why I sound like I'm in a big room right now as opposed to sort of like having my vocal cords like tied directly to your eardrum. <laughs> uh, so it's like this sort of network of echoes that's happening from all the walls and like the way that the carpet is probably rolling off the high end and like the hair of the person in front of you is affecting the sound and so on. Um, and that's really hard, that would be really hard to encode like by hand, right? You, you'd be like, say, okay, I want it to sound like it's in this room, so we'll add like a 0.2 millisecond delay from over there. Um, but you can use convolution to sort of skip doing that problem entirely by going into a room and recording uh, basically just the room sound, which is uh, what you would get if you just did like a balloon popping or like a cap gun or a clap. Uh, and then if you take some regular signal. I am sitting in a room different from the one you are in now. You can do the one-liner convolution and get. I am sitting in a room different from the one you are in now. That's true. <laughs> um, and so now basically they sound like they're in the room where that impulse response was recorded which is like kind of cool, I guess. Uh, you can, I mean, I, I've never been in <laughs> making an installation, but like, I really want them to sound like they're in a big room. Uh, but you can do the inverse of this. So if you're in a room with shitty acoustics, like every installation space ever, <laughs> gallery ever, um, and your sound has that kind of crazy boomy stuff and you're trying to analyze sound, you can record a kernel in there, pop a balloon and record it, and then deconvolute the signal as it comes in, and you get sort of a degraded version of a better signal. <laughs> um, big leap. <laughs> um, so remember before I was saying like uh, um, how sort of learning the language of image processing helps you sort of make sense of the, uh, the tree of academic papers that exist out there? So this is, uh, neural networks in general are sort of like hot shit in, uh, I guess, computer vision, but lots of other things too right now. Um, and one of the ways that they're really applicable is recognizing objects uh, in many images. So if you feed, if you have like a thousand images and you say these are all of a cat, or these are all of a certain cat, and you feed it a new image that's seen before, it can say like, yeah, that's a cat. That's the same cat I've seen before. Uh, 
Um, and a really high level reductivist way of explaining it is that it sort of uses, or a com how a convolutional neural network works. It uses convolution to sort of boil the, pro <coughs> the problem down into smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller program problems. And so you have like many, 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 many simple problems and computers love that. <coughs> so they just sort of like fire through it. Um, right, you can see our buddy convolution hanging out in this little diagram here. And in a really funny sort of meta way, if you take this image and do image search on Google, it's like, yeah, that's a convolutional neural network. I know what those diagrams look like. And you get these other diagrams that are like of other convolutional neural networks that people are working on. Um, here's uh, one from Facebook. This is uh, an algorithm or a neural network they're working on called Deface. Uh, so you, you take the block art and then sort of melt her into a few <laughs> and then you have a representation. <laughs> and they're doing uh, convolution pooling convolution, which is like convolution of effects. <laughs> uh, uh, this is I, I only bring this up because it's funny, it's over my head. Um, don't don't walk away from it thinking I actually totally get how this works. Um, but this is a paper that came out uh, a couple of years ago uh, of a particularly efficient way of uh, implementing it. Um, and in this paper, you, uh, they, they have diagrams like this, where it, uh, this is showing um, how the neural network uh, derives these kernels. So that, you know, this looks like those gap kernels I've shown before that detect lines in certain spaces and so on. Um, and you can do it on phones. It's not like you don't need a server farm or anything. Here's where I get my one video. Oops.
how it works in interesting ways, etc. Um, okay, so I've been talking math a whole lot. Um, you want to see a cellular example? Yeah. Sure. Yep. Okay. So this is just uh, treating um, vertices of uh, two spheres in a cube as a signal, and then obviously audio as a, a kernel, and is um, so basically just convoluting the vertices with uh, audio. Here it comes.
there's there's a lot of these like repetitive peaks like all the way down the thing, especially with that keyboard sound. Um, and the kick drum is like way off the side here, right? It's like the very last pin, and then when the percussion comes in, it's like, can you even see my mouse cursor? Yeah, I guess I can. Um, it's like, like almost everything from here up is like high-end percussion stuff. So, um, well, you can get some cool stuff going on with, a, uh, with an FFT if you sort of start bolting it to um, uh, some Spear and that sort of thing. Um, it's good to sort of actually play music on it and look up what it likes and what it doesn't because it doesn't respond to music the same way that your ear does. Um, it really has a preference for sort of high frequency noise or the resolution is much higher in the higher frequencies. Whereas your ear is actually really good at getting resolution in the lower frequencies and things like bass and actually the vocals are usually like here-ish but then with sort of echoes uh, like harmonics that kind of go up but harmonics are sort of annoying. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, sort of. Um, again, FFT is one of those things that uh, sometimes the implementation is kind of complex, but you can usually get a, like a one-liner or two-liner version of it in whatever creative coding thing that you're working with. This is also a Fourier transform applied to images, which you probably see less often. So these, uh, so the way before that the red line and the blue line were actually just two different representations of the exact same data, or the exact same um, sort of signal. Um, this is just coming on my webcam as well. Um, admittedly, I don't find too many uses for this, but it is kind of neat to play with. One of them, one of the uh, uses that you might actually run into is that it's good at uh, doing alignment. So it's good at sort of, because uh, everything, all strong lines end up converging through the center. So if I kind of make this off axis, but then sort of move <coughs> around, it kind of, you kind of still get the same reading. So it's good for like detecting when sort of something's in a line and you want to line it up because you just kind of turn it into your own until you get that. It's a trick, but you know, <laughs> bear with me. <laughs> okay, who's heard of catch drum? Nobody? Did it actually get nobody? Oh, awesome. Um, so, uh, same way that the Fourier transform gives you the frequency domain representation of time domain stuff, so the red line was the frequency domain, the red line is the time domain. Capstrom is sort of another domain. And I, so this came out of a paper in the 60s by three people that I imagine were sitting in their parents' basement. Like, <laughs> you know it would be really awesome? We do an FFT on an FFT, <laughs> <laughs> and then they did. <laughs> um, and they call it the catch drum because it's the spectrum, but you flip around. <laughs> it's actually what it is. If you go to the Wikipedia page, they, they instead of frequencies, they're frequencies. And instead of filtering, it's liftering. If you ever want to rage quit a Wikipedia article, <laughs> I made it about halfway through the first. <laughs> Um, anyway, it turns out this is actually pretty handy um, for voices. Uh, voices are usually really noisy signals, like surprisingly noisy. Your ear is pretty good at sort of deriving meaning from the noisy signal of a voice. Uh, male voices are usually way noisier than female voices, and kids' voices are usually pretty, are even less noisy still. Um, but it's really hard to kind of derive meaning from a voice. Uh, I mean, you've probably done like uh, speech detection. Um, so the bottom uh, is the Fourier transform again. It's uh, This is sort of a more raw representation of it. You can see it's kind of more spastic. Um, and the top is the catch drum. Uh, a useful representation of the catch drum is the mel frequency catch drum, whatever. <laughs> I mean, if you Google catch drum, it's like the second thing that comes up. This is sort of one of those uh, uh, qualities of it that ends up being really useful for a lot of things. Um, and so these, these 13 values I'm plotting as a line like this. Uh, and if I speak <coughs> slowly, you can see it kind of like bends around all the different consonant and vowel sounds that I'm making. Whereas the Fourier transform is just like flipping out, right? It's, it's really hard to look at the Fourier transform right now and derive any sort of meaning from it. Like whenever I make a s sound, it just is like, yeah, that's the most important thing in the world right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
again, high frequency noise, the Fourier transform is really, really into it. It's a good thing, it, again, I'm gonna keep hammering that in because the Fourier transform seems like one of those magic things that's super awesome, and it kind of is, but then if you don't really know how it fails, you're in trouble. Um, anyway, uh, the capstone is a little bit easier to visualize in 3D because it shifts around really fast because I'm speaking sort of fast, I guess, maybe. Um, so you can kind of see how this landscape is shifting and moving as I'm saying different sounds. Uh, and so with the catch drum, I mean, you wouldn't want to start doing your own like speech recognition library in 2014. You, you're gonna have a bad time. <laughs> Um, but with this, you can start sort of identifying individual people. You can start uh, obviously telling generally what sort of consonant vowel sound they're making, and you can also start telling mood a little bit. If you kind of uh, build up a model of what a person usually sounds like and then see how it sounds different and tag it and then be like, when they're sad, they kind of sound like this peak is a little bit higher usually and that sort of thing. Yeah, this is, uh, again, I brought this one up because I was like, I wonder who's gonna know about the catch jump? Because I mean, this is, one of those, this is one of those tricks that I found that was like really handy for kind of doing weird magic shit. Uh, that isn't uh, a well-traveled way, as much as like the sort of cliche of a T-sphere that's in the not thing is. Um, I'm gonna cut it off there. Because <laughs> I feel like I've said a lot of math already. Um,